Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Now I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus, filled with the sweet spirit of the living God. And that your soul is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Well, we're continuing our study through the story of the Bible. And today we pick up in chapter 42. Now we know that Joseph has been sold into slavery by his brothers due to the jealousy of the dreams that Joseph had specifically. But even from the favor that his father showed unto him, we have learned that he endured a long prison sentence falsely accused by Potiphar's wife through the interpretation of some dreams that Potiphar's servants had, Joseph has now been exalted into the courts of Pharaoh and he is second over all the nation of Egypt under only Pharaoh himself. And he was exalted because he also interpreted the dreams that Pharaoh had indicating that there are seven years of plenty coming and seven years of famine that are coming. And so Joseph has said, if you will take everything in the first seven years, all the surplus and store it away for the last seven years, for the time of famine, hunger, and suffering, those reserves will get the people of Egypt through the seven years of famine. And that's where we pick up in chapter 42 because the seven years of plenty have come and gone. All the reserves have been stored away. And in verse 1 of 42, it says, When Jacob, now remember, Jacob is the father of the 12 sons of Israel, which will become the 12 tribes of Israel. And most importantly, he's the father of Joseph, who is now second in command over all of Egypt and is primarily in charge of dispersing the surplus of food to the people of Egypt. So when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his 11 sons, why are you sitting here simply looking at one another? Do something about this. He said, I have heard that there's corn in Egypt. Go down to Egypt and buy some of this corn for us. For this is the only way that we will live and survive this famine. And so Joseph's 10 brethren, not 11, his 10 brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, the youngest son of Rachel, he did not sin with the 10. For he said in his heart, something may happen to him. I've already lost the oldest son of Rachel, my beloved. I'm going to do everything in my power to protect my youngest son. So he doesn't send them with the 10. Well, in verse five, we're told the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those who came. And of course, there are many there to buy corn. Now, Joseph was the governor over all the land. It was he that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came before him. They bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. This is the fulfillment of the dream that Joseph originally had. Do you remember back in chapter 37 when it says that Joseph had these dreams and they were an indication that his brothers would bow down to him? And in verse 8 of that chapter, his brethren said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or will you have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more of his dreams. And even in verse 10, when he told it unto his father, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed bow down ourselves to you on the earth? Yes, that's exactly what you will do. And that's what we see taking place here in verse 6. His 10 brothers have bowed before him with their faces to the earth. Now keep in mind, Joseph is an Egyptian. He has an Egyptian wife. He has two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, who are named with Egyptian names. Joseph has been in Egypt for many years, 
And so he understands the Egyptian language. He dresses like an Egyptian. He looks like an Egyptian. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he knew them. He recognized them, but he made himself strange unto them. And he spake roughly unto them. And he said, where do you come from? And why are you here? And they said, we have come from the land of Canaan to buy food. And in verse eight, Joseph knew these were his brothers, but they did not know that this was their brother. And Joseph remembered his dreams. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see if the fruitfulness of Egypt that you have heard is really true. And they said unto him, no, Lord, we are here to buy food. We are your servants. We are all the children of one man. We are not spies. And he said unto them, no, but you are come to see if the rumors are true about Egypt, if we truly are fruitful, if we truly have great supplies. And they said, we are 12 brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is with our father and one is no more. Now, you know, they could have said we are 11 brothers and they could not have even brought Joseph up. And them seeing Joseph as a stranger, there was no way he would have known. Yet they recognized the fact that Joseph is no longer with them. And so Joseph said unto them, I have given my word, you are spies. And the only way you can prove to me that you're not spies is that one of you in verse 16 will go and fetch your younger brother, the brother that remained with Jacob, Benjamin. And he certainly is the brother that Joseph loves the most because he wasn't part of the plot to kill and to sell Joseph into slavery. The rest of you, the nine of you, will be kept in prison. And when the one returns with Benjamin, then I will know that you are not spies, that your word is true. And so he put them all in a prison cell for three days. Now, it could have been four, it could have been nine, it could have been one. I think it's very significant, and I don't want to draw anything into the text that isn't here, but I think it's very significant that it, they were in prison for three days. And on the third day, Joseph told them to do what he had commanded them, to choose one to go back and to get Benjamin. And he said, do this because I fear Yahweh, I fear Jehovah, I fear the Almighty, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now this had to speak in the minds of the 10 brothers because Joseph is proclaiming that he is not a normal Egyptian. He fears the true and living God. And so they say in verse 21, we are very guilty concerning our brother Joseph what we did unto him. We saw, we were witness of the anguish of his soul. I mean, can you imagine when they sold Joseph to those Midianites? Joseph must have been broken, weeping, asking why they would do this to him. And they were witness of his sorrow, of his confusion, of the hurt and pain and anguish of his soul. And when he besought us, they said, when he begged us, when he pleaded with us, we would not hear, we would not listen. And it is for this reason that we are now experiencing this. We are reaping what we have sown. And Reuben, the one who wanted to protect Joseph to keep the other brothers for killing him and was going to go back and get Joseph out of the pit and return him to his father, basically says, I told you so. He says, I spake unto you in verse 22, saying, do not sin against the child, but you wouldn't listen to me. Therefore, now his blood is required. Now, Reuben is under the illusion that Joseph really is dead, just like Jacob is. But the other nine brothers know the truth. Well, in verse 23, they did not know that Joseph understood them while they were speaking. They did not realize that Joseph could speak Hebrew. Because Joseph was speaking unto them by an interpreter, pretending that he only knew Egyptian. And when he heard them speaking, he heard their discourse. This brought all the emotions back from that day and everything that had haunted him up until that point. And he turned himself about in verse 24 and he wept. The reminder of that day and of the betrayal that had taken place, he wept. And after he composed himself, 
he returned unto them again and began to speak with them. And he took Simeon and he bound Simeon before their eyes. He then commanded his servants to fill all their sacks with corn, but to put all their money that they had paid for the corn back in the sacks. And so they, not knowing what had been done in verse 26, they laid their asses with the corn and they left for home. And as one of them opened his sacks to give his ass food, to give his donkey food, he noticed his money in the sack. And he said to his other brothers, my money is in my sack. And their hearts failed them because they knew how powerful Egypt was. They certainly knew how powerful Pharaoh was. And they knew that if this thing became known, they would spend the rest of their days in a dark, cold prison cell somewhere in the bottom of Egypt. And they were afraid and they said to one another, what is this that God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Almighty has done unto us? Well, eventually after their travels in verse 29, they come unto Jacob, their father, back into the land of Canaan. And they told him all the things that befell them. And Jacob said unto them in verse 36, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, he's, Joseph has been killed as far as Jacob knows. Simeon is back in a prison cell in Egypt. And now you want to take Benjamin. And Reuben spake unto his father saying, you kill my two sons if I do not bring Benjamin back. But Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you. His brother is dead and he is alone. If mischief were to befall him by the way in which ye go, I would not be able to bear it. You will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Well, after some time had passed in chapter 43, verse two, it says, after they had eaten up the corn, which they bought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, go buy us some more food. And Judah said unto his father, the man told us not to return unless we had Benjamin. So if you're willing to send Benjamin with us because you said that you weren't, then we will go down and buy more food as you have asked. But if you will not send him with us, we will not go down. We cannot go down for he won't even give us an audience unless our brother is with us. And so Jacob, Israel said unto them, why have you dealt so illy with me? Why did you even tell the man you had a younger brother? And they said, the man asked us. He asked if our father was alive. Now remember, Joseph knows who they are. They don't know who Joseph is. But isn't it a strange question that he would ask if their father were alive? And do they have another brother who is not there present with them? Well, they didn't think this through, so they just simply answered his question, honestly. And so Judah now says in verse 8, as Reuben said, look, if you send Benjamin with me, I will take responsibility for the young lad. And if anything happens to him, you can take my life. But if you want us to stay alive as a family, you have to do what this man has asked and allow us to take Benjamin back with us because that's the only way we can return. That's the only way we can get more food. And that's the only way we can survive these dark and dreary days. And so their father said unto them, if it must be so, do this. But this time when you go, take the best fruits in our land with you. Take the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And be sure and take double money in your hand to repay what was put back in your sacks. And hopefully it was an oversight and they won't look at you as thieves. And in verse 14, Jacob says, God Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah, give you mercy before the man. And may he send you back to me with your brother, Benjamin. Because if it is not so, I will not be able to bear the pain. And so the brothers take the present, they take the double money, they take Benjamin, and they rise up and they go back to Egypt. And I want to close there today, friends, but I don't want to close without spending the time in going back and addressing the issue that when Joseph saw his brothers and he remembered the way that they had betrayed him, one whom they should have loved, one whom they should have protected, that betrayal struck him at the core of his heart and he wept. 
Now, I want us to fast forward 2,000 years to the life of Jesus. And so often when we think about how Jesus was persecuted, how he was falsely tried, and how he was horribly killed, we think about the actual lashes that he received from the whips. We think about the nails that pierced his hands. We think about the spit that ran down his face or the fist that struck him. But friends, I want you to know, and I can assure you, that that's not what broke the heart of Jesus that day. What broke the heart of Jesus that day was the betrayal that he had received from the hands of his very people and his very creation. And although he had given his life to a ministry of love and service and kindness and compassion, how the hatred within men could be so intense so that to rather than bow before him in adoration and worship, they would be so willing to strike him and to kill him. And throughout all the ages since that day, even to the day that we live in, there are those who hate Jesus so intensely. And the reason they hate him is because he is so meek, because he is so loving, because he is so kind because he is so compassionate. And yet Jesus still to this day weeps for them. He weeps that they've given themselves unto such hatred, that they will not resist the flesh, they will not resist the devil, but they are bound by their own pride. And even if he were to stand before them in all his glory, all his majesty, all his beauty, they still would reject him. But instead of us pointing the finger at them, which is so easy to do, them, the unbeliever, are we guilty of rejecting the Lord? Are we guilty of rejecting the things of the Lord? Are we guilty of following our own way, our own desires, our own passions, our own pursuits, our own likes, filling our life with entertainment, pleasure, short-lived happiness, and mediocre commitment? Or have we fully resigned ourselves to his full and absolute will in giving ourselves to full and absolute surrender? That's the question I want you to ponder today, friend. And I want you to remember that when we fall short in our commitment, in our dedication, in our service unto the Lord, Jesus looks upon us and weeps because he knows what we can become. He knows the power that lives within us, giving us the ability to live victorious lives in him. And yet when we neglect such a precious gift, Jesus weeps. Oh, friends, it's my prayer today that your heart will be broken in realizing that many times you yourself have been guilty of breaking the heart of the Lord. May your journey be blessed today, friends. May you find rest in God. May you find peace in the spirit and may you find and experience the quietness, the timidness, the meekness, and the humility that is found in Jesus the Son. Now, as he wills it until next time, I truly love you, friends. I'll see you on the next video.